with me in the studio as always Five Lives boxing commentator Mike Costello and writer and broadcaster Steve Bunce. Evening, gentlemen. Evening, Evening, Ellie. Now we all expected to be here previewing Hay Against Fury, Mike, didn't we? Yes, we did in my diary for today. It's two workouts, one by Hay, one by Tyson Fury at Ricky Hatton's gym in Hyde, not too far from our studios here. Tomorrow would have been the way in and we really would have been getting excited about it now because the build-up had all the signs of being explosive. It already was, so by fight week, even more so. And a date has been announced already, Steve. Yeah, I'm surprised. In fact, I, I was convinced we'd had two, three or four weeks, but they've come up with about 70 hours after the cut appeared with February 8th back at the Phones For Us venue. We'll give it its full title once during the show. Up here in Manchester, formerly known as about a dozen different things. It will happen, so they say. Hey, it's a long way off. We'll talk in lots of detail about that fight. Let me tell you that in the Super League playoff, it's Warrington 6, Huddersfield nil. That's the latest score uh, just underway. Uh, in that match. But Mike, you have been to see David Hay, even though he's not fighting, he's talking and he's received a lot of criticism for postponing. He has. I mean, there are many out there who are convinced that he doesn't fancy the fight, that he never intended to fight in the first place. And even going as far as to say that he inflicted the cut on himself deliberately to get out of the fight. He's had criticism for sparring so close to the contest, accusations also that he wasn't wearing a headguard. And apart from a couple of official statements, Hay hasn't spoken about the issue this week. So I went to his gym in Vauxhall in South London to talk to him. And it's underneath railway arches close to the Vauxhall railway station. So you'll hear trains rumbling as as we spoke. But I think what what's what he really wanted to do was to take me back to the fateful sparring session last Friday, just a few feet from where we were sat talking. First round was good. Lots of slipping, lots of sliding, doing what Adam wanted to do. Um, second round, same sort of thing. Just sort of back and forth. I, I wasn't all over him. He wasn't all over me. It was just good shots thrown. And as the bell went for the, the second round, walked back to Adam and then I felt I had something in my eye. I uh, saw Adam's face <laughs> and it was like, uh-oh, he's, he's got a, he's something wrong. So he has a look at it um, and he's like, get out. As soon as he said get out, I knew there was, a, I knew there was an issue. And um, unfortunately, it was a big, dirty gash <laughs> over my, uh, my left eye. Without a doubt, um, even if the board would have allowed me to box, which they wouldn't have done because they're not stupid, they know as soon as uh, it would have been touched by anything, even just warming up when I sort of rub my knuckles all over my face before a fight to get the skin warm and ready to get sort of punched, just doing a warm-up process would have opened my eye up on Saturday. So it's obviously um, there's no, no alternative, but I couldn't have been any more gutted. Knowing how hard I prepared, I've, I'd say this was probably one of the, the hardest training camps I've put my body through. Really, really pushed it. I got in the best possible uh, sparring partner, better than Fury, to be honest. A lot of the guys, uh, Marius Vak, um, pushed uh, Vladimir to the limit. You had uh, uh, Deontay Wilder, 29 fights, 29 knockouts, no losses. You know, big, strong guys. Uh, Richard Towers, another undefeated um, big guy. Alexander Dimitrenko, another guy, six for eight. You know, solid record, you know, world ranked. So I had all these, all the big guns, all the big guns who you would assume they're the guys who are going to do the damage. And I ended up getting cut on the last spine session from a young amateur 21 year old. He was in bits, the poor guy. He was, um, he was really upset, you know, because he, he'd been working well with me over the, over the last few weeks. He was here with his coach and he was just, it was just a shame it all sort of uh, finished on such a, such a bitter note. Did you think at first, because you were so desperate for yeah. the fight to go ahead, we've got to do something about it? And then gradually it dawned and, it, and, and you thought... <laughs> There's no way. I think it was only until um, I was at St Thomas's Hospital and it was getting stitched up, and um, I think that's when it really sort of sunk in. Because no one, no one said anything. No one said, "Oh, you can't fight with that." Everyone was going, "Okay, it'll be all right. It'll be okay." It was everyone was just trying to be very positive about it. And it was only until she was stitching it up, and I sort of had the, my and I was taking pictures as she was doing it, so I could see it. It just I remember thinking, "This is going to open up." I know the amount of blood that was coming out of it as well, right over the right over my eye. I mean, if it, in a fight, if you get a cut like that and it's bleeding like it was, the fight's automatically stopped. And the fight's, if it's early, the fight's a no contest or you lose the fight, one of the two. It's just a, it's just a gutter, you know. Everyone keeps saying, oh, yeah, everything happens for a reason, but I can't think of, <laughs> I can't think of a, a good reason, you know. Um, it's, just, it's just one of them gutting things. Happen. But, you know, I, the, the way I see it, I've had, I've had my fair share of good luck in boxing, two weight world champion, you know, I've been on foreign territory and won titles. You know, I could have had bad luck with the judging out there, but I had fair good luck, I'd say. 
and um, something like this happens, you know, I can't, you know, be crying about it. It was brought up that um, George Foreman sparred, same time I did before his fight in the Rumble of the Jungle when it was originally scheduled. He got a cut in one of his, in his final sparring session, and uh, the Rumble in the Jungle was uh, delayed six weeks. So, you know, it's happened at every level. It's happened... Um, Throughout the years, uh, lots of lots of uh, world class heavyweight spar close closer to the fight than what I did. I've heard a bit of uh, I heard people saying, "Why was you sparring so close to the fight?" Well, I've I've done it in the past and never had a problem. Most world champions spar up until that point. You know, even I know Carl Froch, a good friend of mine. He does he does the same thing. He actually spars closer to the fight. You know, every other fighter I know does that. But it's just it's just one of those things. Um, and I'm just <laughs> obviously gutted or gutted about it. I mean, I'm looking at the cut now, which stretches most of the way across the top of your left eyebrow. You posted pictures on your website. They appeared on the BBC Sport website. And yet there were many people on social media who (laughs) chose to ridicule you as as somebody who'd done it deliberately. (laughs) I know. If if any of you know how how vain I am, having a big gash across my forehead isn't uh, something I, I do purposely. Particularly to get out of a fight with Tyson Fury, you know, a guy that I was a, you know, a massive favourite to beat. You know, it's like me doing something to not go in there again. But before I fought Audrey Harrison or, or Derek Chisora, you know, why would I try and get out of these fights? These are easy, easy fights. As, as far as I'm concerned, these are easy fights. What was tough in this for me was the sparring. I want to be the world champion again, and to be world champion, you need to mix a, mix in the best, and that's what I got. The environment I got in the gym, because I knew um, going into a fight with um, Fury, his his skill set is so, you know, um, it doesn't compare to mine or even the guys I was I was sparring with. So I knew it was going to be an easy knockout. I think every, most people knew, you know, as soon as I started hitting him on the chops on a regular basis, he's going to be hitting the floor, and the fight's going to be over. And um, you know, for people to insinuate that I headbutted the wall or done something stupid to get out of this fight is. It's ridiculous. What about the accusation that you weren't wearing a head guard? Yeah, that's another one that um, that was kicking around. Apparently, I was. I wanted didn't. So I read. I read on the article that apparently I wasn't wearing a head guard because I wanted it to be. I wanted the feel of realism. Some some mental made up. Um, I was wearing the same head head gears I always wear, and never had an issue. Same gloves they were wearing. It was, everything was exactly as it's been throughout my whole camp. It's just like a, a football player warming up uh, or doing practice the day before a big match and just tweaking his hamstring or his groin. You know, that it's the same move they've always done. You could say, oh, why was, you do, why was you doing that move so close to a game? Well, it's something they've always done and never had an issue. It's just one of those things. Have you been surprised by the volume of criticism over the past week or so? Um, no, I'm not surprised. You know, whenever... It's not, it's not that people um, have been vindictive. It's just they're disappointed just like I am. I know I'm disappointed. I'd love to be able to blame someone, but I know there's no one really to blame. But people out there, you know, they're so hyped up. They might have had their mates get all coming round on Saturday night to sit down and watch the fight, and now it's not happening. So they need to point a finger. Who are they going to point it at? They don't really know who the guy I'm sparring was, so they can't point at him. They point it at me. You know, I'm the one who got the cut. So, David, it's your fault. Why were you doing this? Why weren't you wearing a head guard? They don't care. They just want to point a finger. So if they want to do that, you know, they can do that. But, um... The fight's been rescheduled for February 8th, which it seems like a, a lifetime away. But it'll, it'll be round um, sooner, r- very soon, and um, you'll be able to see exactly what happens. But it is part of your personality to bring that kind of criticism <laughs> on. I mean, you, yeah. you enjoy clearly controversy, and in, you know the old adage of Muhammad Ali was that if people turn up to see me win or get knocked out, yeah. as long as their checks don't bounce, yeah. I don't care. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, um, obviously, with with the with the, the bold predictions I make uh, with my fights, um, you know, you, you're setting yourself up really. You know, if if you don't do it, if, even if I knock him out in the third round, everyone's going, "Ah, oh, but you said the second round, you're rubbish, David." You know, it is what it is. You know, I, I put I add extra pressure on myself, and by doing that, sometimes you set yourself up for for criticisms if it doesn't go exactly how it goes. And it didn't go. I said I was going to knock him out in the second round. The fight hasn't happened because I got cut and sparring in the second round. So I've got to live with that and I've got to go through training again. But I'm not that fast. Everyone's going to say, but you're going to be, you've been out of the ring for so, was it nearly two years come, come February? But I don't really see it that way. You know, the fact I had a good training camp and we got so close to the fight, I did all the training that needed to be done for a fight. I just didn't have that fight. So I don't think I'll be um, ring rusty come uh, February 8th. Now Tyson Fury enjoys mm. the verbal sparring mm. as well. And, He's issued a statement talking about you being queen of the jungle and crybaby. <laughs> yeah. But behind all of it, he seems convinced, as does his uncle and trainer, Peter, that you don't want this fight. 
Well, you know, I wouldn't have signed for the fight if I didn't want the fight. You know, I could have gone a million different ways. This fight doesn't make mean anything to me. You know, I didn't really want to be thinking about Tyson Fury in 2014. For me, 2014 was all about getting a world title shot. Now, through this incident, I'm going to have to. Tyson Fury is going to still have to be on my radar. Why would I take a fight that I didn't want? It doesn't really make sense. I know why he wants to fight because he's going to get paid probably 20 times what he's ever earned in his career. I want the fight because it's a fight that the fans want to see. Tyson talks a lot. He says a lot of stuff. Before the Cunningham fight, he was saying, oh, he's the baddest man on the planet. No one could touch him. He was going to walk through him. He's too big, too strong. And he ended up dumped on his backside in the second round and struggled through against a guy who's, a, who's not a known puncher. So he talks a lot and doesn't produce the goods. He punches himself in the face when he fights. I'll be the first live heavyweight this guy actually fights. He can talk all he wants, but you know, the proof of the pudding's in the eating, and I've been, uh, I've been knocking out people way better than him for many, many years. Well, Peter Fury said earlier this week that you've negotiated for other fights while you've been under contract for a fight in the past, and, and that's why they fear I'd, I'd like, this I'd like might to, not happen. I'd like to know which one he was talking about, because that, that's never happened. I don't know, I'd like to know which, which fight he's referring to because I've never negotiated for one fight whilst being under contract uh, for another. You know, doesn't really make sense. What is your mindset for this one, David, compared to the many big nights you've had in the past? Mormick and the Cruiserweight title win in France, the Klitschko fight, which you lost, Audley Harrison, which turned into a, a dud of a fight but was a huge build up. How is your mindset compared to those massive events? My mindset's pretty similar whatever fights in front of me, you know, I, I wouldn't say I was more motivated for Klitschko than I was for Audley Harrison. It sounds crazy, but a fight is a fight. You've got to treat everybody as though they your worst nightmare. Otherwise, you're going to come into the ring unprepared. And I'll, I'll, I'll prepare for Fury uh, with that in mind, you know. Although, if I just looked at his videos and watched him, I'd probably get a full sense of security and think, oh, this guy's useless, so I could just turn up and knock him out. But I don't do that. I haven't really been watching Tyson Fury fights. I'm not interested in watching it his negative sides. I want to think it, this guy's going to try and drag me into the trenches. He's going to be boxing like Muhammad Ali, coming at me like Mike Tyson. I'm just wanted, I want him to be that. In my mind, to get up for training, to really push my body to the limit, I've got to feel under threat from someone who's bigger and better than I've ever seen before. So that's what I'm going to do with Fury. So logistically, what's the timeline from here on, David? What have you been told medically? Is the, is the recovery time? When do you get back into training, um, sparring? I won't be able to get punched on this, punch in the eye for probably six to eight weeks. I think that's a safe amount of time to get, give your eye a rest. You know, I'll be, I can do stuff you can do to massage the scar tissue underneath it so it's not lumpy, so when you get punched, it doesn't, it doesn't break. But, you know, I'll keep training. I'm always, I'm always in the gym, always, always, always ticking over. You know, I don't have to do one of these... Um, biggest loser fat camps that uh, Tyson Fury does where he takes himself away from his local uh, McDonald's and goes out and hides out in Belgium somewhere in the, in the you know in some field somewhere and does his training there you don't have to do that you know I've got the discipline to stay in, in London and, and do what I need to do they're so bitchy these heavyweight boxers aren't they <laughs> That was David Hay with our boxing commentator, Mike Costello. We'll talk about it in a second. Uh, Warrington 6, Huddersfield 6 is the latest score in the Super League playoff commentary on Sports Extra right now. England's women uh, lead Turkey 7-0 now in their World Cup qualifier. Scotland are 3-0 up on Bosnia. So, Steve, what do you make of what you heard from David Hay there? Well, well, first of all, um, he sounds like a man who's at peace, and so he should be, and he's absolutely right. He talked there about the gaps that he's had between fights. He had eight months off before he fought Vladimir Klitschko. He had 12 months off before he, before he fought Del Boy, and this time he'll have 19 months off. The break, let's get this absolutely and categorically clear now, the break will not in any way hinder or hurt David Hay once he steps in the ring on February 8th. And secondly, his training, his sparring, must have cost him about £100,000. He brought in terrific fighters, really good fighters. As he said, and in his opinion, and in other people's opinions, some of the guys he brought in are actually better, certainly higher ranked, or as highly ranked and rated as Tyson Fury. What's not been, what, what's not been said here, and, what, and what's going to remain a vast, stinky, smelly monkey in the room, is it if we is whether or not Tyson Fury can go from last April when he had his fight until February, we know, and Fury has said it, 
He wants a fight. And it's the one thing that stands between this fight happening. And it's, and it's, a, it's massive because, according to Fury, he hasn't signed the contract, the new contract for the fight. The old contract, the existing contract, if it's still valid, forbids either of them stepping outside and having a fight. I think it's inconceivable that Fury will want to go until February 8th without a fight. And I think it's equally inconceivable, sorry, Ellie, that, that Hay will allow him to have a fight. Because the one thing that David Hay said, I'm doing this for the fans, is also doing it for near enough a record payday that he'll put in his pocket. So just, just make it clear why, it's, why the delay is more damaging to Tyson Fury. Because he's never had that type of delay. He's a guy that, uh, as David hinted and joked about there, could get fat in the interim period. Plus, he's a guy that's not used to training for 7, 8, 9, 10 months without a fight. He's a guy who's used to training for eight, nine, ten weeks, fighting, having a couple of weeks off, putting on a few pounds, going into training camp. He's a young guy. He's an excitable young guy, and he needs to fight. And every day this fight goes after the 28th of September, without Fury getting back in the ring, it gives David Hay such an edge, a bigger edge than he possibly even has. Mike, do you think that he's genuinely upset, David Hay, that he actually is gutted about this postponement? Oh, there's no question about that. You know, Steve talked about the money, but it's it's also about where it would have put him. He he spoke in the interview about getting set again to to place himself right there in the line of a, a title shot against whoever the, the champion might be come the middle of next year, the end of next year, now after whoever wins on February the 8th. But I walked into the gym yesterday and I just happened to say to David and his great friend Elliot Worsall that, you know, I was so gutted not to be able to do commentary on this fight. I was really looking forward to it. And David just turned to me and said, you are. You, know, you, you could just sense what it means when you've put that much work in. And for all those who might have, you know, been, been talking about what type of sparring he was doing... Most of it was behind closed doors. So even we in the media didn't get any kind of private access. But somebody on Twitter aligned with the camp did release a couple of minutes a couple of weeks ago. And, and it showed just flashes of some of the sparring sessions. And they looked really, really intense. Mm. They really did. You don't spar like that if your intention ultimately is to pull out of the fight. But boxing likes a good conspiracy theory, doesn't it, Steve? And, and what Tyson Fury has said, Tyson Fury signed the contract and then looked at David Hay and said, you'll pull out of the fight, you don't want to fight me, you're scared of me. And he has kept that mantra up. In fact, as we've been on air, he's been doing something live on Sky. He's kept that up and he'll keep that up until they get in the ring. He'll be walking down the aisle. When the referee touches gloves on February 8th at about 11 o'clock, which it'll be live on 5 Live, when they touch gloves, he'll say to Hay, you don't want to fight me you're scared because that's what he truly believes hand on heart that's what he believes and there, there is history of breaks ruining fighters chances back in 1989 um, Michael Watson was about 20 seconds away from finishing his sparring. It was the last round of the last day of sparring with a guy called Ray Webb in preparation for a WBA middleweight title fight against Mike McCullum. He was in the best shape, the best shape of his life, and he was absolutely ready. But he, he broke his nose with the last punch. Eric Seacom, the trainer, went stop. And as he said stop, Ray Webb caught him on the nose, broke his nose. The fight was delayed. McCullum went and had a 12 round title fight, stayed sharp. Michael couldn't get a title fight. He ended up having. 11 months out of the ring, he got in a ring and his timing and distance was terrible. So there is a precedent for it. And Steve, you were talking about how Tyson Fury is excitable. This for him was much bigger oh. than anything he'd been involved in. I think two really important people now over the course of the next four and a half months from now through until fight time will be his uncle and trainer, Peter Fury, and his promoter, Mick Hennessy. They've got to somehow now drag him down and maybe even just, just get him to disappear for a few weeks to calm down and then to just start all over again because otherwise he'll let everything go now and never be able to, to recapture it. Well, as uh, Muncie has said, when the fight happens, you will hear it here on Five Live. <laughs> 